Hi guys, today we're going to continue on with crimes against the person and we're going to go over a couple different crimes and like I said, we're going to use Pennsylvania law wherever it's applicable um, and we're just going to talk about a few more of the crimes against the person that can be committed. This is not going to be an exhaustive list. There are certainly other crimes that can be committed in which someone is harmed, um, but these are pretty much the main ones that you guys need to know for the purposes of this course. So the first one we're going to look at here is kidnapping. And the elements in Pennsylvania um, are as follows. We have an unlawful removing of another, a substantial distance under the circumstances from the place where he is found. And the key here, guys, is it's a substantial distance under the circumstances. So you want to look at specifically what happened. If you have, say, a baby and you take a baby from one house and you move the baby to the house next door, that could be kidnapping. That's a substantial distance to take a baby that doesn't belong to you. Um, <clears throat> so when we say substantial distance, there's no cut and dry, like, well, they took them one mile or a thousand meters or anything like that. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be a far distance. It has to be substantial under the circumstances. A lot of times when we think of kidnapping guys, there's usually some like end goal, like somebody is kidnapped for ransom or uh, something like that. And again, this sort of goes back to what we see in the movies. It can involve holding someone for ransom. It can involve causing actual bodily harm to that person, terrorizing them or inflicting bodily injury on them. It doesn't have to. You can kidnap someone and you can treat them very well. And in fact, sometimes that does happen. Sometimes you see people kidnapping someone um, and raising them as their own child or something like that. And in that case, even though you might have good motives, um, maybe you want to raise this person as your child. Maybe you give them great opportunities and a nice house and you love them very much. At the end of the day, if you've unlawfully removed them from where they were, that still counts as kidnapping. So this goes back to what we talked about when we started talking about um, motive and mens rea and all of that good stuff. You can have a good motive, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't commit an intentional crime. Um, I do want to point out here, guys, and the only reason that I'm pointing this out is because it has come up in the past. Kidnapping doesn't have to involve an actual kid or an actual child. And I did have a student once, uh, they were working on some scenarios and I had something written where um, a 30 year old was, you know, taken from her place of work and somebody held them in the basement against their will. And they were like, well, this isn't a kidnapping because it didn't involve a kid. It involved a 30 year old adult. Um, so I guess in their mind, they had always associated kidnapping with kids and it doesn't have to be. There was no age limit to kidnapping. Kidnapping is a state crime unless the victim is taken across state lines, in which case it becomes a federal offense. And we've already talked about this a little bit, guys. You can have a state crime that is very, very serious. Federal offense does not necessarily mean that it is more serious than a state offense. Um, murder in the first degree, for example, is a state crime. You can be um, put to death for it. So if you kidnap someone and you keep them within the state where you found them, it's a state crime. If someone kidnaps a person in Pennsylvania and then takes them across state lines into West Virginia, it becomes a federal crime. <clears throat> okay, guys, we're going to move on to assault and battery. And assault and battery can be a little bit confusing because in a lot of states, Pennsylvania included, um, they call both of these crimes assault. Assault in the traditional sense is basically when you threaten to harm someone. Battery is where you actually harm someone. In Pennsylvania, though, if you look at the way the laws are written, um, you can have assault and you can have that where someone is actually hurt. So assault is a threat. And then assault and battery can also be used interchangeably to mean the actual attack. All right. So here are the elements, an attempt or a threat to carry out a physical attack upon another person. And it has to be upon another person. You can't assault an animal or a piece of property. While arguing about whether they were on a break, Rachel waves a knife at Ross and threatens to stab him. So again, she doesn't actually stab him. She just waves the knife at him and says, I'm going to stab you. All right, guys, this constitutes assault. If you threaten someone, and again, you have to mean it. It can't be a joke. And I know sometimes you might be like, oh my gosh, um, my best friend's annoying me. 
I'm going to punch him in the face, all right? Unless you're actually threatening to seriously punch someone in the face, it's not going to be an assault. Um, but if you have a threat and the person feels like you are being, like they're being threatened by you, then that constitutes assault. Battery, on the other hand, is when you actually have the unlawful physical contact. So battery is when you actually do physically hurt someone. Um, it's inflicted, again, by one person upon another person. So you can't commit battery against an animal or a piece of property. If you take a baseball bat and you, bat, you smash in someone's car, um, that's not going to be a battery. That's destruction of property, but it's not going to be a battery. You can't have consent. And you might be thinking, well, when would I ever consent to let somebody batter me? And you would be surprised because if you start to think about it, guys, um, there are lots of situations where one person makes physical contact with another person and sometimes in a violent manner and, and they consented to it. I mean, sports is really a prime example. You watch hockey, you see people checking each other, football, people are tackling each other, boxing, people are punching each other. Um, in those cases, they have consent. If you agree to get into a hockey, um, to, to get into a hockey ring and, and play a game of hockey and someone checks you, you can't then turn around and have that person arrested for battery because you consented to a certain amount of physical contact, okay? Guys, here's the other thing that tends to confuse students is that you don't have to have an actual injury. All we need to see is that the person intended to do bodily harm. So you might have two people walking down the hall, all right? Mr. Geiger is walking down the hall next to Mr. McLean and he shoves him. Mr. McLean might barely feel a thing. Um, it doesn't matter. In this case, it's a crime. You don't need to show, well, he bruised me or I fell or anything like that. Anytime you have the unlawful physical contact. Um, and again, what we're looking at here, guys, we're looking at something that really exceeds the boundaries of society. So <clears throat> let's say you're standing in a crowded elevator and the door opens and you need to get out. The person in front of you doesn't realize you're trying to get out. So you lightly tap them on the shoulder and say, excuse me. Okay. Um, it would be very hard pressed to show that that is unlawful physical contact. That's sort of within the norms of our society. Okay. If you shove them out of the way with your elbow though, um, that could be considered unlawful physical contact, even if they're not hurt, even if they're not injured, even if they're just merely annoyed. Now, practically speaking, are you going to see someone get arrested for this? Probably not. Um, what we're talking about here, guys, is in theory, in theory, you've committed a crime Practically speaking, you're probably not going to see too many police officers that are going to pursue this as something that they arrest you for. A lot of states have varying degrees of assault. And like I said, in Pennsylvania, you're probably not going to get charged with battery. You'll just be charged with a higher degree of assault if you actually have that unlawful physical contact. So in Pennsylvania, um, for example, we would look at, um, like, do we have simple assault? Do we have aggravated assault? Sometimes you have assault with a deadly weapon. Um, it really just depends on where you're at. And like I said, a lot of the states will use these terms interchangeably. So Pennsylvania, if person A walks up to person B, points a gun at them and says, I'm going to shoot you. That's assault. That's a threat. Um, if person A walks up to person B and punches them in the face, that would still be considered assault, even though in some states that might be called battery. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. <clears throat> okay. And the last thing we're going to look at here today is stalking. Okay, sweetheart, yes, you may have the Doritos. And Ray already had Doritos, so she doesn't need any. Sorry, guys, we had an important, um, we, we had an emergency here. My son wanted some Doritos. You know how that goes. Okay. So we're going to talk about stalking here, guys. And in, in Pennsylvania, the elements are where you have a person who repeatedly follows or harasses another person. It can include making threats. It doesn't have to. And we have the victim um, who fears death or bodily injury. Pennsylvania is different than some other states because in Pennsylvania, it can also include causing emotional distress. So maybe you have someone following you 
and you don't necessarily believe that that person is going to physically harm you, but the person is causing you emotional distress. It's making you stressed. You can't sleep at night. You're anxious. You have anxiety. You're on edge. Um, that counts in Pennsylvania as the second element of stalking. Statistically speaking, women are usually the victims of stalking, but it is certainly not impossible to have uh, a situation where a man might be the victim of stalking. Okay, guys, here's an example. Alex's ex-husband shows up at her workplace repeatedly, even though she asked him to stop. She becomes nervous because her ex-husband refuses to stop coming to her workplace. And he begins to leave threatening notes on her desk when she is not there. So if we go back and look at our elements, we have someone who is repeatedly harassing her. He keeps showing up over and over again. And he has her nervous for either death or bodily injury because he's leaving threatening notes. So he is actually threatening to harm her. So in this case, we would have stalking. Okay, here's another example, guys. Jenny becomes distraught when she realizes that a stranger has been following her home from work every day and sitting in a car outside her house while she is at home. In this case, we do have number one's pretty clearly met. Someone is repeatedly following her. Fact pattern indicates that someone's following her home every day. Um, what we have to look at here, guys, is do we have the second element, which is causing the victim to fear death or bodily injury? According to the facts, we don't, but we do have someone that's causing her emotional distress. So if you look at the facts, guys, um, he's sitting outside her car every day while she's at home. This would cause anybody a certain amount of anxiety. So because she is suffering emotional distress, even though this person hasn't threatened her or made her fearful for her, her bodily safety in any way, um, we can count this as stalking according to Pennsylvania law. All right. If anyone has any questions, guys, you can go ahead and either leave them in the comment section of the Google Classroom or you can send me an email. Hopefully you guys um, understood all of that. We're going to do in the next slide, we're going to do a shorter um, presentation on sexual assault. So um, look for that in another video. All right, guys, have a good one.